Hello and welcome again to all of you who have joined us today for another session of Festival of Urbanism. This is Better Plans Equals Better Places session, and I'm Turan Alzadeh at the University of Sydney. Before we begin with the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of our nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built, as we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within the university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of the country. Uh, and if there is anyone that this is their first session of Festival of Urbanism, Festival of Urbanism is supported by the Henry Halloran Trust, that is a research fund uh, established at the University of Sydney through the generous donation of Warren Halloran and named after his father, Henry, who was a leading Australian developer and an early advocate of um, planning in Australia, in case if anyone has any question. Today with me, I have Halver Dalheim and Leslie Stein to talk about a new book on strategic planning, a topic that is very close to my heart. Just as a way of introduction, Halver Dalhain has over three decades of experiences as a city planner covering a state and local government and the private sector, including roles as an executive in the New South Wales and Victorian state government planning departments and the Greater Sydney Commission. Leslie Stein is an adjunct professor of urban planning at the Sydney School of Architecture, Design and Planning. He is the author of the textbook Principles of Planning Law, and his most recent book is Comparative Urban Land Use Planning Best Practices. He has been a consultant to governments on strategic planning, including the Greater Sydney Commission and the United Nations. Uh, so without further ado, I have a series of exciting questions in front of me to talk to Howard about his very new book. Howard. The very first question, why a book on a strategic planning? That's a good question, in particularly in terms of my point in my career, in terms of what am I trying to do? What, what I feel is that I am having been involved in strategic planning all my career, how can I add some um, value, build capacity in the planning profession? And I felt that putting a book together, in terms of what the book's about, I'll just put up a first slide in that I think this slide tells the story of why the book. This is a slide I've used all of, for nearly most of my career in terms of, because I think it tells a lot of stories. For, exa for example, is the king where he is because maybe there was the wrong messages about what it is that he wanted in terms of how, what was the instructions? Or is it because of the plan that was developed? Was the plan based on the wrong information, et cetera? Or was it ultimately because the moat um, contractor was never involved in the process and never and didn't we really understand what the plan was about? So just decided to actually build a moat, um, a moat where he felt like. So that I think is the challenges in planning. It's it's um, we have a lot of processes that we all put in place, but is there some type of pattern book, a, a, a guideline that could help us maybe deliver um, better plans and therefore better places? So that's what I've tried to do. Right. Uh, it sounds like you didn't jump straight into the how to do elements, but so to dig a bit deeper into the purpose of a strategic planning. Why is that? And I think that's the sort of exciting part that um, the university raised in terms of, I could have in one sense just gone, okay, I've been involved in planning a long time, spoken to a lot of people, looked at existing plans and said, okay, here's a way forward. But I tried to think a bit more about um, where have we come from in terms of putting a plan together? What's the purpose of a plan? What is it about? And in that sense, um, what I tried to think about was um, in, for example, in Nicole um, Garan's book, it says right at the start, planning is about intervention. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that, whether it's because of negative ex externalities or whether we're trying to deliver some um, social good. But when you think about, okay, we want to have um, a, um, uh, an intervention, we're implicitly saying that business as usual won't work. Therefore, we're also assuming that we've got some evidence to suggest that um, there's an alternate future 
that is better. So, and I think importantly, and sometimes we don't nail it as well as we can, like the, um, the, the King situation, do we understand what is required to deliver that alternative future? So behind that, in terms of the minute you say, okay, is business as usual acceptable? You're also assuming we, on what basis are we saying that? Um, is it about the community's needs that it's not acceptable? Um, is it because of an, an, an externality? So what is it we need to understand in terms of um, a, where we're headed to? And I think the question I've come down to is, what we're trying to understand is what is important to people, their lives, and the places they live in now and in the future. So that means I need to understand what is important. And that's a bit of a challenge. So what I've thought about is, okay, when we start a process, we often say, okay, we need to understand what's important. Okay, so how many houses are being built? Where are the jobs? Um, we think a bit about open space. We think about biodiversity. And we put those things in place and do a pretty good effort at trying to understand them. But is that the full range of things that we could have had to think about? So in that sense, what I've tried to do is to think about, and I've looked at all the current capital city plans in Australia, looked at plans from overseas, what are people trying to talk about? And so there I've, I feel that there is a way of putting together a, re a research framework that helps us answer that question about community's needs. Also, when you think about um, what's, is business as usual okay, we need to say, well, we're assuming that there's something about the future. So what do we mean by the future? Um, and in that sense, I think there's three questions. What do people today need? Because that's pretty important. And I've sort of seen it as if you have children today, in the near future, what is the employment that they're going to be involved in? And then I think there's a third question about the future of um, the long term. What are the things that have the same value today? Like Hyde Park to me has the same value today as it's always had. And in a hundred years, it'll still have the same value. So what are the things in the city that retain that type of, of outcome? So I think there, then I think the last part is, do we understand place? Cities are about place. So what are we trying to do in, in that respect? So I think what I've tried to do is rather than just jump into the plan, think about the purpose of the plan, the scope of the plan and what planning is about. Cause I think that's, quite important. And for me, the book is very much in the first instance of textbooks for students. So you want students to think about those things before they jump into the next space. Uh, you mentioned a research framework. So what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, is it about this range of questions that you went through or is it something more than that? Um, the research framework is probably um, the thing that I'm most excited about in, in the book, because as I mentioned, when you try and answer the question, what's important, one of the challenges in thinking about what's important is, um, have we answered everything that the actual client wants us to think about? Because when you, when you do a project, it is often a case of there's some clarity as to the issue. Um, um, so for take the, the King, in one sense, it was about um, security and safety. But there's, there's wider questions that you need to ask as well in terms of providing the full advice to the client. So what I tried to understand was how do we um, put that into some type of structure? And actually took a, a fair amount of reading and thinking to come to that. What I eventually feel, felt was that um, we have um, um, two, uh, three, three areas that we're trying to provide advice on. One is when you start a project, the very first thing you think about is um, just the actual context of the place. So I think there's two, two areas where we need to understand there. One is just the community. So it's the socioeconomic elements of that community. And what, uh, what do we know about that? Then the other part is the physical side, literally. So how many houses are, what's the transport network? What's the open space network? So, and so there's deeper questions but, um, um, below that, but that's the two, two areas about understanding the current context. The next thing, area that I think in these three areas, so it's sort of a three-step um, research framework, is um, the needs of people. And I think that there's four little areas we need to think about. 
One is the straightforward needs of people and households, which is um, access in terms of urban amenities. By urban amenities, I mean um, access to goods and services and jobs, and, and how much do you have within your um, area of that component. On the flip side, there's the needs of business. Um, in terms of what do they need to operate as a successful business. And part of that is not just about the, the land that they're working on, but it's supply chains and access to customers, et cetera. So we need to understand the household side and the business side. There's also a quality of life component. It's not just purely about the tangible things that we touch, it's also about um, individual and community wellbeing. So there's a range of elements to do with the quality of life. All of those three, to me need to be distilled then into a fourth area, which is what I've termed um, uh, a growth and change equation. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm always keen up front in a, a document to go, okay, what is it that they're trying to accommodate in terms of business as usual or future? This many people and this many jobs and this much additional retail or the, um, the hinterland in terms of its output is growing in relation to agricultural and mining output. So, what is the things that you're trying to accommodate going forward that for some reason you feel that businesses as usual won't deliver on? So you're trying to say, we need to create more opportunities for centers to grow or places for more houses. So that's the sort of um, the, the qualitative component about people's needs. The last part is about the performance of the places we're working in. The, the first area um, is transport and digital. I think digital has gone from nowhere to everywhere in a decade. And so when we think about accessibility, it's no longer just accessibility and literally, do I walk, do I cycle or catch a, catch a train somewhere? So it's the performance of that network in terms of its coverage and as well as the um, uh, 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 um, quality of the service that we're actually providing. The next part is the actual um, quality of the environment. So all things from natural hazards, quality of biodiversity, all those components, how do we understand that? So that's my earlier point about what's important to people and the places they actually live in. And it's not just the values we put onto, but it's the value of the environment for its own sake, not for our sake. Then um, the third part is we do all this when we manage whole of communities. And there's some elements that you don't really, uh, sort of when I start to think about it, you don't put them in the earlier bucket. So we have to provide utilities. We have to manage whole communities, not just individuals. So when we manage place, there's a, there's a whole of community component. So if we go to probably not the next slide, but if we jump two slides, um, there's a slide there, next one. So that tries to put it into a, a sort of a linear framework. You have the social contact text, you have what's important to people and businesses coming down on that central one of growth and change. And then you have the qualities of performance of place. So that's what um, I see as the a process. So this is the research and analysis phase, and then you're moving on to, this, to, to bring it um, together. So sitting behind those nine boxes are 35 individual research frameworks. And what the book has in terms of part three in the book is and a, a full pulling apart as to what each of those 35 means in terms of what's the research objective, what's the approach for each one, and what are some of the considerations. So I've, it's not just a case of here's a couple of headings, going into it and going, these are the things I think people should think about. You don't need to do everything when you do a plan, but it really is a case of going, we have enough information on that. We, but no, we don't have any information on that, so let's explore it. Do you need primary research? Do you need secondary um, research? So that's the part where trying to um, put some structure to a phase that is often, we work pretty hard to do it, but it's more uh, stakeholders telling us what to investigate rather than coming with a, with a framework. So that part I'm, I'm really quite pleased in terms of what's been done. Thank you, Holbert. That's, that's a very comprehensive structure. And I'm sure that um, our students, especially, will find it very um, helpful. Having said that, ultimately, plans are about delivery. And you emphasized this earlier you know, by referencing implementation. So what insight do you have for improving delivery? I think 
delivery is probably one of them. As, as you mentioned in your question, it's, we assume that planning is about intervention. So therefore it's about some type of, of um, delivery. We get, I think, very excited about preparing the plan. These are the objectives for a place and not saying that any of them are wrong. But we also then pass the responsibility for delivery to the last two pages. We have a section called implementation and we say that this has to be implemented, implemented and we're going to do certain things. I learned the, the hard way, but it was a very good lesson when I went from private practices to a council. Worked on a town centre plan. Um, the council thought it was really good and the people in works, works and operations said it was very good. But one council meeting later, so two weeks later, another report went up straight away and said, just a minor tweak, we need to change one element of the implementation in terms of waste management. Um, and when I spoke to the um, to works and operations person who became a very good colleague after that, he said, you never spoke to us. You never asked us how we were going to deliver the waste management component. And you proposed this really fantastic looking waste um, bin to have in the main street, look fantastic. We don't have the ability to pick that bin up. So two weeks later, he got counsel to actually change the recommendation that that type of bin we wouldn't include. So it sort of, it made me think about, if I'm going to have a plan delivered, the person who's going to deliver it needs to be there at the start. They need to be part of the journey so they can put their hand up and say, look, that is really good, but it won't work. So in that sense, land use planning and transport planning is the one thing, two sides of the same coin. So for a start, the transport planners must be at the table on day one. And for, if you're looking at metropolitan planning, um, health and education need to be there on day one. So when it comes towards your plan preparation, you can say, we have a proposal on action. Will you take responsibility for that? So can you, can you write it and say, your minister will say that they will deliver that? In the book too, the, the book talks about preparing a plan in seven steps. Most of those steps are fairly obvious to people. Establish a study, do research, um, synthesize it, um, prepare the plan, exhibit it, finalize it. But I've got a seventh step, which is plan delivery, saying that um, you need to make sure that there's a governance arrangement after your plan is finished. Who is going to take responsibility for delivering the plan? And also, I suggest in, in that section, often we prepare plans um, once every, um, so often we don't go to the point of um, how do we make sure that there's um, an ongoing recognition that cities are dynamic. So we need to think about the fact that um, uh, the, um, how do we deal with those changing, those changing elements of a city as distinct from just going once every five years, let's do a plan, get it implemented, come back five years later. Things always happen as we've seen for the last um, 12 months. So I put forward a way of suggesting that there's an ongoing structure that you could have to how you do planning. So yes, you still do your plan every once every five years, but you can have a very deliberative process, a very structured process, for not just monitoring the plan every 12 months, but then how do you update the plan every 12 months or when you need to, because the government decides we need to look more at say coastal policy. So they, they put in place a, a new coastal policy. How does that go back into the plan? What in the plan needs to change? You shouldn't wait for five years to put that back into your plan. So that needs to be a, quite a um, deliberative process in how we, in how we prepare and change um, uh, a city over time. And that to me is a simple thing. It's going from preparing city plans to doing city planning. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be, it's one thing I don't think we do yet in Australia. Um, and it's often a, a case of we've done the plan. Okay, can we get back to doing what we always do? As distinct from strategic planning should be a dynamic process that is continually providing advice in terms of how we um, deliver on a, on a city. Uh, it, it, it's uh, fascinating because especially this part of your book, you know, what you're proposing is much bigger than uh, lessons for our students because in a sense, you are basically proposing an overhaul of the way that we do a strategic planning. It's almost about a new way of governing a strategic planning in Australia, you know, to get 
that link between um, being dynamic uh, versus the five or 10 year, you know, uh, current uh, timeline of a strategic planning, right? Do you want to elaborate a bit more about that? Yeah, so it's, um, so as you say, the, uh, it really is about thinking, how do we um, change how we think about, so strategic planning is about managing the continual change in a city. One thing we know about cities, they're always in flux. There is no end point. If you're not doing a plan to say in, in, in the year 2030, we'll have this lovely place because there'll be other things continually coming on, on in front of us. So what I've been trying to think about in terms of putting up a process is that you're continually thinking about how the city is, is changing. So the question of those 35 research areas, they should always be just on the horizon in terms of what is happening in those research areas. So it's, it really is taking strategic planning is just not something that we do once every five years to something that is leading what we're doing. And it's what the Act actually says. The Act in, in, in New South Wales, I think, is really, it's very small, the area on strategic planning, but it's quite significant because it's emphasising that strategic planning should start at that regional level, whether it's a metropolitan or a region, and cascade right down to the DA. And I'm thoroughly of the view, having been involved in, in that detail level in the past, that if we can work the strategic planning at that fine grain, look at the 35 different areas, involve the community, and I didn't sort of emphasise that, the community must be involved in every, each of the seven steps. It's not that you involve the community in ex exhibition. If you involve the community in exhibition and haven't talked to them, then it's too late. It's mm -hmm. actually really not worth it. So if we can do that, by the time you get to the DA, the DA should be a tick and flick because you've dealt with at the strategic level the question of scale. You've dealt with it at the strategic level that there, you have a transport system that works. So therefore you're saying we want to have more housing in here because transport has agreed that that will work. So those strategic questions have been ticked off. So when you come to the, um, to the actual DA, to the, to, to the, sorry, I've broken one of my own rules. I try not to use acronyms. When you come to the a development approval, or if anyone from Victoria planning permit, um, that um, you need to make sure that, so if we do that, the approval is really um, right down to some really minor details. Has it delivered on this? Has it delivered on that? Rather than them trying to actually push through some complicated justification. And so my feeling is if there's some feeling the strategic planning slows things down. If it's done correctly, it will speed things up because the approval process will be a lot faster. And so that's what I'm trying to get to is that use strategic planning as it should be used as distinct from going, okay, this is really about just something to put on the shelf. Okay, thanks, Halvard. We'll see you in five years' time when you can do it all again, as distinct from, no, we're trying to get the, the community's input, the business people's input, understanding from a range of areas how the city can evolve over time. Not trying to think that there's some master plan. Cities change too much. Um, we're trying to move forward. What I learned from look, doing some of the research here is that a view of what's important has changed over time. So what we value today isn't what we valued 50 years ago, isn't what we valued 100 years ago. Because we are giving higher expectations in terms of Aristotle, um, we come to, 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 to cities ultimately for the good life. Of what we define as the good life, the bar is continually going up. And with social media, the community is telling us quite quickly what that might be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before going to our um, discussion today, I already have um, a question when someone wants to know how they can get a copy of the book. Um, <laughs> I am desperately trying to make sure um, I showed Peter, I've, I've, um, the, just before this started, Peter Phibbs, that, um, who's been massively helpful in terms of Henry Allen and Trust to, to give me some support. I'm trying massively to have this finished by Christmas. Um, and um, I'm just doing the last edits at the moment um, to get that. So I'm hoping in the new year, people will have access to this book. Great, great. So in time for next semester teaching, I cannot Absolutely, wait for I've got that. one of your colleagues is very much a case of how, what I'm assuming I've got, a, you've got it ready for next year's semester. 
Yes, yes, that, that's, that's wonderful news for all of us who teach in uh, strategic planning, including me. So anyway, um, now I uh, want to actually hand over to Les Stein to reflect on the Q&A that, or the conversation that Halbert and I had. Les, we are very much interested to hear from you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I want to <clears throat> use this by taking Halvard's ideas and apply them, I thought, constructively to uh, planning, strategic planning in Greater Sydney. Um, I should entitle this short discussion piece uh, with apologies to Jane Jacobs as the life and death of the Greater Sydney Commission. Um, this is a reflection, I think, of how strategic planning goes wrong. Uh, to put it in perspective, I have to start with the, the question of how could we all have been so naive to not foresee that the Sydney Commission, Greater Sydney Commission, was going to do irreparable harm to Sydney. It's so gravely misunderstood the process that he's been talking about that we now have, I believe, a broken planning system. Strategic planning has gone wrong, and it'll force the state government to find a way around planning laws and to approve developments as it did years ago with the infamous Part 3A. Uh, there are many illustrations of this failure, and I'll touch on only three in the short time I have. Uh, you know, it all started really nicely with the metropolis of three cities, the strategic plan for the greater Sydney region, which said that good planning should be about livability, sustainability, and productivity. We all felt hope. I mean, I did at the time. It sounded really good. Uh, but the commission never uh, followed up to tell us what do these vague terms mean and how they should operate. Instead, they gave examples in the three cities plan, and we had to somehow deduce from these examples what was being suggested. I'll give you one example. The strategic plan says that we should create places, great places that bring people together. But how do you actually get people together? Uh, is it you have more community centers, you have more coffee shops, more chances to bump into each other, as Jane Jacobs once suggested? We don't know and we're never told. So when the councils, the filtering down process that Harvard was referring to, had to prepare the local strategic planning statements to reflect these objectives, the councils came up with even vaguer statements. Uh, my favorite's the Liverpool one, which suggests, for instance, and maybe this is the worst case, that in order to attain livability, you had to, quote, reduce the proportion of people leaving the LGA, the local government area, for work and study. Sounded to me like another lockdown. You know, you might need passports on the Hume Highway. Uh, I won't even comment on the inadequate assurance process of the commission that let this and other crazy material through. Now, I say this, it all sounds so strong, but it has to be understood in the context of other cities that got strategic planning right, such as San Diego, Toronto, Berlin, Greater Copenhagen. There, the governments developed manuals for the public and councils as to what these ideas like livability and sustainability mean and how to put them into practice. It actually took councils by the hand and said, this is what we mean, and this is what you should think about. Uh, San Diego is one example when they were doing plans for public places. They said the plan required the city to look at what existing public art there is and identify other areas where public art might be incorporated. Now, I don't want to get too personal about it, but I, I did go into the Greater City Commission and I begged Lucy Turnbull, Sarah Hill, the chief planner of the commission, to create a manual for this purpose, to, in order to avoid, uh, avoid it being horribly wrong, uh, to prevent just what has happened. I even asked Minister Stokes and said, um, we need a manual. He understood completely and uh, but said that it really is a final decision of the commission. And sadly, the commission put their head in the sand or more deeply in the sand and assumed they had a foolproof system or that somehow all the councils were on the same page. See, the practical problem where it goes wrong, as it has, is because this local strategic planning statement has to then be shoehorned into the planning controls, the LEP in New South Wales. 
That's the legal instrument that dictates how these areas are to be zoned and what's permitted. Imagine turning a 271 local strategic planning statement of the city of Sydney into an LEP. It's an impossible job. We now have these unwieldy, verbose, and aspirational documents that have been bizarrely allowed by the GSC in a failed assurance process because councils were never aware of what was expected of them. How can that be possibly made the subject of legal controls? In most countries, such as uh, cities in the United States as examples, the LEP is accompanied in the one document with the strategies about livability, sustainability, and productivity that we use to create the zones and uses. And Melbourne's got a version of that. They're read together and they complement each other. So, and this is possible because the state government has told councils what they want and what the concepts mean and how to turn them into zoning controls. This enables a resident to say, oh, I see now why my land was zoned this particular way. I can go back and look at the policies. I can have a line of sight. This means the only choice that we have in, because we don't have that system in New South Wales, is to have a manual, some guidebook, which actually says to the community, this is how the various pieces fit together. You can understand why your land is zoned to permit high rises um, rather than some other land use. And this is how you read the LEP in respect of these strategic plans. There are no guides in New South Wales produced by the commission, no way to know how to properly represent these ideas at all. Now, the, the tragedy of this um, and why I'm uh, bringing it up is that without these clear concepts, the, there's no way in which a person can properly seek rezonings and indicate their strategic merits. There'll be crushing delays in council as the council really works hard to try and create this LEP based on the LSPS. It'll take a long time, probably a year, this will in time foster a strong inclination for the state to go around the planning laws by make-believe ideas such as shovel-ready developments, getting fast-track approval in order to have a, quote, development-led COVID recovery. There will eventually be government interference um, in the decision-making. We see this all the time, as in Piermont. The strategic planning system in Sydney, therefore, is a mess. All those things that Halvard is bringing up in his book have been somehow ignored and not carried out properly. A fatal mistake uh, is, for instance, that the indicators that the GSC has came up with, has come up with to assess the strategies are useless. Having indicators to assess the strategic planning system was said in the three cities plan to actually be critical. But now we have absolutely no way to tell if these strategies, which are a consequence of what Halvard's suggesting in his book, will actually work or be successful to any extent. For example, if I, it tells us that a city of great places has 8% of trips for educational purposes. Well, and it says for a collaborative city, we find that 10% of schools have a shared use. This and other figures drawn from consent, the census data don't tell us anything. They don't tell us how it's working, and which would be a miracle. It's traced back to the failure to explain by way of a manual or guidebook for the public. None of you outside the planning profession would have any idea how this whole thing works. If I ask you to tell me why there's a particular zone in Leppington, uh, you can come back to me in a month, and by then you probably figure it out. Uh, we don't know what these things mean. What's a collaborative city? Uh, the min what's livability? In fact, Minister Stokes, uh, after we met, said, made an announcement that I'm not sure what livability actually contains. We need to define it better. I think it's now become an embarrassment. It's like uh, Giuliani has been running the Greater Sydney Commission. So it's all strong. Uh, and it's all controversial, but I'm embarrassed by it. I live here. This to me is what strategic planning is. Just before the, uh, the 
COVID crisis, um, I was a visiting scholar at Columbia Law School and was asked by a student in a lecture I gave about international case studies of strategic planning. What's the best planning system in the world? And at that time I said, it's probably Vancouver. And then somebody else raised their hand and said, well, what's the worst strategic planning system in the world? And I had no hesitation in saying uh, New South Wales, Sydney. I live here, it's my city. The book actually needs to be implemented by the Greater Sydney Commission paying attention to the need to explain things, not become a, uh, a closed off environment in which these things have nothing to do with the public. I believe actually, and this is strong words, that the Greater Sydney Commission should be ashamed and we need to get it right. And we need to actually put out a guide and we need to put out manuals. People need to know how this all works. And I'm worried, actually concerned, that the same thing is going to happen with the same kind of movements to the western city parklands and the Aerotropolis. So that should stir you all up and give you a good chance of thinking about, uh, about what's going on. And uh, I'll leave it to questions and comments. Thank you, Les. You definitely gave us something to think about. And if, uh, you know, if, um, we cannot be provocative here at the Festival of Urbanism. I'm not sure where we get that chance. In saying so, I feel like um, I have to give Howard a chance to respond. And I also do that uh, with this thing um, at the back of my mind that we are having a lively conversation happening in the chat box. So I will go back to the questions that you're receiving for, uh, from our audience. But before doing that, Howard, this is your chance to respond. Um, I won't go into, into detail, but I think one of the, the lessons in terms of what we've been going through that I've only been in Sydney now for seven years and um, came to Sydney and got involved in an earlier metropolitan plan and then got involved in the plan with the Greater Sydney Commission. One of the things I've observed and many of my colleagues have talked to me about is that um, for a range of reasons before we were doing the, before the commission started, a lot of the emphasis of, of planning activity in Sydney was about facilitating the changing of zones in terms of Sydney core planning proposals, in terms of allowing for more and more um, um, development. Also recognising that a bit over a decade ago, the, le the, the level of development, particularly housing development in Sydney was very, very low. So one can see that a government will say, let's do that. So there'd been a, a decade history of let's look at how we change zones, how we change zones, how we change zones, which changed the whole philosophy in terms of how the planners were thinking. Then the government introduced these, what's called um, Division 3.1 strategic planning, which said, no, we should have some um, um, uh, vision as to where we're headed to in terms of when we're changing what we're doing in the city. In that sense, my experience is that when you move from one to another, um, you can't do it just as you swing a pendulum. If you swing a pendulum, you just come back to where you were. So my feeling is that this is a bit of a gradual process. I don't disagree with Les at all that we need to provide better um, guidelines in terms of how we do things. But I also would suggest that it, it has been a fairly big shift for the government to say, let's move away from that um, incremental approach to do a strategic approach. And we learn as we go forward. What I would hope is that we do learn from what we've gone forward in terms of um, now that we've sort of put in place the three elements and we're finishing the last bit of changing the, the, the planning controls in line with the strategic documents, is what have we learnt from all of that? And I would hope from that we actually go, okay, um, is there now an improved way from what we're, from what we're doing? Are we, are, is the intent of the plan understood? The question of livability is just an interesting one. As an aside, in Victoria, that people talk about livability all the time. Supposedly, Melbourne's one of the most livable places in the world. And we had a new secretary come down in Victoria and said, you all keep talking about livability. I don't know what you mean. And everyone's going, but, but we do. So I think some of these words are understood and some of them are not. And I think um, Les does touch on an important point of when you say something, I've always um, said, it needs to be very clear on Monday morning when the person who's going to deliver the livability outcome, that they know exactly what they're supposed to do. And so in that sense, um, 
I think um, Les raises an important question about are the elements of the plan understood in terms of what we want the councils to do? What now? And it's only part of the story. Most of the city is built by the private sector. So do they understand what we mean? So I think in that sense, what Les is doing, I think in a, in a nice way of being very provocative, which is nothing wrong with that. And as you say, that's the purpose of the Festival of Urbanism. If we can't be provocative here, where can we be? Um, but I think that the, the answer is we have to learn from, from what we've done. So I think Les has raised some questions. So um, what is our response to that? And to me, it's councils, did you understand? Are the plans still fluffy from the top all the way down to the bottom? So therefore, the, um, if the developers go, I've got lots of wriggle room here, well, we haven't done our job. We should be very, the developers should be very clear as to the intent. We need to give them certainty. I actually raised in my book, we need to give them, we need to have flexible certainty in that we have to evolve over time. You can't be rigid to say, this is how the world's gonna be for the next couple of decades. Thank you very much, Howard. As, as I said, we have a very lively conversation happening in the chat uh, box. So I'm gonna try my best to cover as many questions as possible. The very first one that I have in front of me, as planners, we plan and advise, but governments make the actual final decisions about the plan and implementation. Could you please talk about this political dimension? Howard, this is addressed to you. Um, well, they're absolutely right. Um, um, as people who are a person who's been involved in preparing for plans, you provide advice to government in terms of what you're doing. You're trying to give frank and fearless advice in terms of, of what the options are, but you're also, your role in government um, is to deliver on the government's objectives. In, and so if the government has objectives in terms of, of facilitating more housing or doing whatever, that's your role to do it. So it is important to understand the um, political dimension. And to me, one of the best ways to understand the political um, dimension is to have a good community engagement process. Because at the end of the day, the, the government's political in objectives are linked to what they think the community is desiring. So uh, um, if the community is very clear about certain outcomes, so then there's, a, there's a, a, a requirement for us to make sure that we understand what the community is after. But there's also a level which is, which is why you can't just, uh, why we should move to ongoing planning. Because sometimes that there's a, a need to understand um, that we have to have a role of, of um, educating. We have to have a role of providing advice. It needs to be a two-way story with the community. One part of, okay, so um, we don't want this outcome, but here's consequences of those outcomes. So, and that, that requires an ongoing dialogue. You can't just turn up once every couple of years and try and educate the community because you want the community to educate yourself. You need to learn from the community in terms of what they're thinking. As, as well as trying to say, these are the consequences of if we go down that path. To me, if we can do that part in, in a better way, then there's a chance that the, the, the political people who are making the decisions will be clear on why we're making certain suggestions and what they think is important from the community's perspective. Uh, is part of the strategic planning better or worse than no plan at all? And there is a second part of this question. If we are planning for the future, who is arguing the side of the future community? So that's, of all, the big part, the big challenge in strategic planning is to understand um, what people's aspirations are for the future. And I think it is possible to, to think about what they may be because we've all we've all lived through the future in the sense of we were who we were a decade ago two decades ago and i think part of the process is just tr trying to think about what are the aspirations we have today for ourselves access to jobs access to um, a walking environment um, places for our kids to go to school etc so what we're all we're trying to do is to take those elements forward and then think about how we are going to be more sustainable in those outcomes in terms of saying to people, um, I've been in meetings where um, in the past where people have said, okay, we don't want more density. And I would never have a discussion about density. You can't win a discussion. There's no such thing as density done better. What it is is talking to people and saying, okay, 
Where would you like your children to live? Oh, close to us. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Um, whereabouts? Well, they don't have a car, so they should probably be near a railway station. That's an even better idea. And then they'll go, well, and they can't afford a house, so they probably have to live in a small house. So I mean, you mean an apartment beside a railway station is a good idea locally. So it's, I think if we have a conversation with the community about what they think their aspirations are for themselves and their family, you can get an understanding of what the future is about. And then it's a question of talking to colleagues in a range of departments about how can we accommodate that? I think, I think uh, if I could add to that, um, one of the things that's never happened is that the community has never been brought into the tent. The community at this point in time cannot figure out, uh, no matter what tools they use, exactly what's going on in the planning world. Um, it's impossible. If I said to somebody, uh, like I, I gave the example before, who lives in Leppington, please give me an idea about the town center. No one would have any idea what's going on. How do you find it out? If I ask somebody else, what happens if you seek a rezoning and you can't get it? Well, then you have to have this rezoning review to a planning panel. What's that? So the first thing that we've done is we've treated the community as being outside the tent. And we're not interested in giving them a guide as to what happens. All of this developed, as far as I'm concerned, by uh, iterations uh, of various plans which didn't bring the community in from the very beginning. It wasn't part of it. Um, there was some recommendation in the 2013 reform package to actually have community participation uh, at a higher level. So right now, developers see uh, the community as NIMBYs. The government sees the community as somebody they have to get through as part of a process, but the community's not in the tent, so they don't understand what's going on. So the system is now written for other planners. You understand it, Alvin understands it. I'd say the number of people who understand it completely, we'd fit in this one room. Um, it's so complicated. So I think the first thing is it was a recommendation, a review done of the planning system and the Productivity Commission as well, and the first thing they say is a guide for the community. It, educate the community. And why that's not done, you have to tell me. I can't understand why it possibly is being ignored. How does, it, how does a community understand the district plan? How does it understand how the idea of housing targets have been put in? Uh, it can't. Uh, Leslie, I also have another question for you. Uh, I'm going to read it out because uh, I think it's actually better that way. Would a return to government land developers being able to take a proactive, demonstrative approach to master planning and development? For example, they've said that the problem in the south southwest, for instance, seems to come down to the very fragmented land and inability of the government to pull a critical mass of sites together. Yes, well, I mean, the whole idea has been that the day-to-day -day planning of areas in the Southwest, that's what you're talking about, um, have to be, has to be done first in a broad brush and then involve the community in what's going on. And uh, the problem is in 2005, which was the beginning of uh, the uh, Metropolitan Plan for 2005, was the idea of starting to do some work on these areas. The latest thing that's come out is that the um, Western City Parklands is going to redo this all again. So people have no idea what's going on, no way to understand the fragmentation, no understand how to bring land together, no one the way to understand whether there should be infrastructure put in a particular place or not. This is all to do with lack of education and the idea that some people sequestered in a particular place in Parramatta actually can take a map out and decide how things actually work uh, without the community's involvement. And the consequence of that is that question. That's what actually happens. You don't really know what's going on. You don't know how it's all going to work. Um, these things should be made transparent. Now, it might sound like I'm talking about an idealized situation, but this occurs in the rest of the world. Uh, a good example is Berlin. Everybody gets a guide to each area to say what the plans are with pictures of what things might look like, uh, how this came about in the first place uh, in different languages, 
all of whom uh, anybody's then able to understand where they fit. Uh, the participation process before that actually happened went over the course of a year where people were brought along and were given a chance to say how they think it should all work and how it should be explained. So the answer to the, the question is the problem of there being an isolated group like Western Parkland City at the moment. Completely, it's, it's gone out and it's done consultations, but it hasn't involved people at the formative stages. I think these things are really dangerous and will continue, New South Wales is gonna to continue to be uh, haphazard and uh, lead to many more instances of corruption. Howard, I have another question for you. How can a strategic place outcomes best be interpreted into development controls? I think in that space, I think we have a little way to, to go in that we've, the plan has tried to, so far, the plan for, for Greater Sydney has tried to provide guidance as to some of the more um, principled outcomes that you want in a place, questions of, of walkability, access to public transport, um, considering about cultural elements. I think there's a need for us to go um, further in relation to um, being able to provide um, more detailed guidance in terms of the, the outcome that we are anticipating to occur and being really quite specific about it. Um, so that, um, so for example, in terms of, of um, how a, a street head should occur. So we don't have to provide the guidance as to how the built form should specifically be, but we need to provide guidance as to what it would be like to experience walking down the street. Um, Les mentioned um, Vancouver. I think through my last 15 odd years of planning, people had always mentioned Vancouver as a, doing some great stuff. And in one sense, you always hear that and go, yes, you know, I, they probably are doing great stuff, but everyone does great stuff. I was fortunate enough to visit Vancouver. And in terms of a street edge, a human scale edge, it really is fantastic because they've managed to understand what it is in terms of in a place that's got 40 story buildings at the street level, it feels like two story. And I feel that I'm walking along windows and doorways and people live here. So they've managed to work out what an outcome is at that street level. And I think that's the part that we're missing to a degree. We're saying that we want a human scale. We want a walkable out outcome. No one would disagree. But what does that mean specifically on the ground? And I don't think that we've got to that point yet. And I don't disagree with Les. A level of pattern book, a level of guidance, not as to this is how you have to do it, but this is what, what we're talking about, that as you walk along a street, just as you walk along a sub, suburban street to a degree, when you walk along a suburban street, you see windows, you, steal, you see doors, there's a level of visual surveillance. In, a, in some of our areas where we've done some high rise, you walk along the, the street and you see fire hydrants, you see entrances to garages, and there's not a, cons, a, not a feeling of this is where people live. And it's the same for an urban, for, for a range of parts of the city, do we have that better clarity as to what success looks like? I think that's the part that my feeling is now that we've done the three levels of planning and I feel that there was a level of get it through, don't take forever. But now that we've got it through, we need to come back and go, so is that what we thought that we were supposed to do? And my feeling is that the level of detail we've got should all go up one level. What people were talking about at local outcomes should be described at a district level. What people were talking about at a district level is important, should go up to a metropolitan level. And the more that we do that, we get greater clarity as to the outcomes for a city. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a development approvals process becomes fairly simple because you've really made it clear what you mean. And it's not saying that everything has to be the same. If you've got a large centre like Liverpool or Parramatta, not every street in it can be active because there's just too many, too many, there's not enough shops to go around. So where is it going to be a quiet area versus, I mean, it's like um, I've been fortunate enough to like a number of people to go to Paris. People wax lyrical about Paris, but when you walk around Paris, the most of the streets are just residential. There's not shops everywhere. It's um, so the w people remember the, the exciting parts of Paris because yes, a tourist, that's where you go, but you don't walk just the quieter parts of Paris. So I think we need to understand that the city is quite diverse and complicated. And we need to recognise where we want to put effort in. Here it's really important. 
And that's usually where there's centers and railway stations and that type of thing, because that's where you want to attract more people to make the city function more efficiently. Um, there is another question with reference to the influence of lobbies and donors. And is asking if the planners have a duty to question those, especially when they conflict with community wishes. I think um, often there's um, lobbyists are referred to in the paper and etc. They get no more airtime than anyone else, and in fact, they get a lot less in the sense of yes, you have, may have a lobbyist come in on behalf of, of of some interested parties, and that's part of the process that is allowed. And those who've been involved in the from the public sector side, you try and put in very high levels of probity to make sure that people are aware that you had meetings with them, et cetera. But at the same time, there's a lot of more, much, much, much more time ta spent talking to the community about their needs. And the, uh, the lobbyists' um, input is just one of the, the elements that you, you put on the table. And I can say, at least for the work that I've been involved with in Sydney, I don't think that um, lobbyists have made a a difference in terms of other than if they've got a good idea, that's great. But I've spoken to lots of people in the community who have, who've had good ideas that we put on the table as well. Okay, and I'm gonna just put forward one last question, um, but I, I'm, I'm doing that admitting that uh, there are questions that we couldn't go through. I'm just cautious of the time. Uh, and this question is talking, this questioner is talking about the battle of planning around three topics of uh, public participation, public interest, and private property right. And they're asking you, how do you weight these three competing interests in a strategic plan? Well, there's, a, there's a, a man years ago who wrote a fantastic article, Charles Lindblom, it was called The Science of Muddling Through. And uh, on the basis that planning is basically a collective bargaining uh, arrangement between private property interests and the community. Uh, so I think the reality is that all of it, we can't discount developers. Developers build the city. Um, you, you know, we can't look at them as a group that must be excluded. We can't exclude the lobbyists. They also help build the city in a particular way. So I feel that all of these interests have to be accommodated, but we actually have um, which is crystal clear. We have no formal form uh, way in which all of these groups can come together in a way to discuss things and add to uh, the future of what this city. The city at the moment is run uh, by uh, interests and the like that we have uh, uh, no no chance to actually understand. The only thing we actually have is the festival of urbanism. We didn't have that. We we wouldn't even have a chance to discuss this. There's no forum to talk about this. I would just add, uh, add that um, I agree that the the absolutely the development sector builds the city. So we have to make sure we um, liaise with the development sector because we need to understand just as with the community is what their aspirations is, and that's why I mentioned earlier. We're trying to understand the needs of people, but we understand the needs of business and particularly the, the implications of, of, for um, development. Um, from time to time, people suggest, why don't we have this or why don't we have that? And the simple is, it's because it's not feasible. Developers aren't able to, to um, deliver it. So in terms of balancing those three discussions, um, A, um, I've in the past tried to have different groups in the room at the same time. And it's quite challenging because one of the things that happens is that everyone all of a sudden is very nice to each other, has a lovely conversation, but no one's willing to say what they actually believe. So often you have to speak to people clearly in a probity environment. So individually, what do you think? And then you put that down. I think to me, part of it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about a research framework. You need to have clarity as to what you're trying to understand in a city where to me, the interests of the people who build the city need to be part of what you've thought about in terms of research. The interest of the people who are um, of, the, of the community or people who are landowners, if you haven't thought about that in a deliberative way, then you're going to struggle to um, deal with it in a conversational way. And I agree the Festival of Urbanism is where it starts. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, the festival of <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. The festival of urbanism is definitely, you know, uh, 
the thing that brings us together and provides an opportunity for all of us to rethink cities. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, both Howard and Liz for a wonderful uh, session uh, full of uh, provocative ideas uh, for the future of our cities and our audience. Um, I also want to um, um, encourage everyone to register for the remaining uh, basically sessions that we have, especially um, the eighth annual Henry Harlan Trust Lecture is uh, scheduled tomorrow afternoon at 6.30 p.m. And um, uh, um, uh, the speaker is uh, Ian uh, Mullen from the Tony Blair Institute in London and will be talking about housing policies something that we definitely need to do better in Australia. Thank you, everyone, uh, and hope to see you in future sessions.